I was actually just with my um, the my best my two best friends that uh, we go back till fourth grade. Now the one thing I notice now, and I'm I'm 38, uh, and they're both 39. We all grew, we grew up same class, uh, and we still are extremely tight. I see them at least once a month. Before we all had kids, it was probably two three times at least a month we saw mm-hmm. each other. But I do notice that um, we are different now. Like yeah. we're still bonded because mm-hmm. we had this childhood that we grew up together, but we definitely have like, we have different political views. Oh, and sure. different, mm-hmm. So it's actually makes a really interesting yeah. dynamic. Are it's you guys spicy. like that? Or are you guys very similar? Like we're, we're pretty similar. similar. Yeah, yeah. I feel like we're, yeah. um, except finding each other after years of education and experience, finding out what she was doing and what was going on was impressive. Like, wow, this is crazy. You've written a couple books and <laughs> yeah, and I <laughs> opened a business and a sizable practice and um, we're both doing our things. That was like what was most remarkable coming back together. But as far as who we are and what we do, very similar. Well, you guys, yeah. you, you were off air. We were talking a little bit about that. I'd love to revisit that conversation because it reminds me <laughs> of the conversation we all had when we first met because we actually didn't even really know each other. Justin and I had worked together 10 plus years ago. Sal and Doug knew each other, but the four of us had never all met before. And when we got together, uh, we were just, we were talking about the fitness industry, all the mm-hmm. issues that we saw with it. Like mm-hmm. we saw the way we saw people marketing themselves and it sounded really similar to kind of what you guys were talking about with the whole family thing. So explain Absolutely. that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we we can just kind of go to a place where we'll, we could talk from Boston Logan Airport all the way to LAX without a breath. I mean, we're wow. we're at that point where there's just so much stuff that we connect over, you know, being moms and and working and and now collaborating together and 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 our our backgrounds are so similar. I mean, growing up, you know, what were we like? Maybe two tenths of a mile away from each other when we were kids. Um, you know, the school was in the middle and we were each on either side of it. So, um, you know, we, we have this lifetime of, of experiences together. And, and it's interesting too, because we have all of this, this past history together and all of these friends, like after we leave, you guys were flying down to LA and we're going to catch up with a bunch of our high school friends who are out there. And it's like, we have all of these things in common. And then we have this chunk of time when we got married and when our kids were really little and we weren't together and living in the same place that we catch each other up on. So either we're yeah. talking about the current stuff we're doing or the stuff we did when we were kids or filling each other in. So we we never really stop. What exactly in, inspired the book? So you guys get together, you start talking about yeah. you, what, what you're right. doing with She's, the previous. She, I banged into her long story short. Oh yeah. I'm writing I'm starting to write some books and I shared what I was doing, which was I'm a psychotherapist and I've been doing this for 25 years and had a sizable practice with my mother for the first 19 years. And we got to talking and she's like, what do you do? And I go into schools, I do lectures, I do public speaking, I write curriculum for teachers, I do all sorts of different things. And when we started talking about the thing we both had in common, which was kids and parenting, we both were aligned in the way that we were approaching our parenting, which was very humanistic. And so I was reading a little bit of what she was writing about, and I was sharing the work that I was doing. And it was just this very natural connection around, okay, this is a very humanistic approach. And that's what I kept mm. saying to Lisa was humanistic. So yeah. you've been doing this for yeah. 19 years in um, schools or longer? Longer. She has yeah. been, yeah. I, I started in schools about 25 years ago. Um, so what have you seen over the, tell us what you, what, what <laughs> well, you there's not enough time <laughs> for what we've seen. We've seen well, a lot. I started uh, 25 years ago. I started in a school in an inner city area just outside of Boston. And I was in the middle of everything from uh, gang warfare to, you know, kids from broken homes living generationally with grandparents that they hadn't, you know, the parents were still over in another country um, to kids who, you know, I was, the t- town was um, sad alongside a very um, upper class, um, nice uh, community where um, kids were privileged. So long story short, I saw both sides. 
Um, and so from that, seeing those perspectives, it was a perfect place to start my career. Um, but I knew that I wanted to be able to take the work I was doing in schools and bring it somewhere. There was such a disconnect. I'd work at a outpatient facility and see kids coming in with parents worried about school and friends. And then I was in the schools working with the teachers and the kids, and there was such a disconnect. So we created New Beginnings Counseling Service, my mother and I, and it was a place to come after school to then be able to see parents and families and kids to talk about anything and everything. And then it got so big that I needed to hire other clinicians because I couldn't do all the direct service myself. So, so mm. why is it growing so fast? What were you, what were you you're obviously <laughs> making some yeah, sort yes. of connection yeah. or yeah. you're enlightening these teachers yes. or parents? I, I think it was uh, honestly the way that I approach things. I'm not here to judge anyone. I'm here to give you four walls and a door. Tell me what's going on. Um, your honesty is um, what helps me um, help you. So come in, talk to me. And I think a lot of people, when they think of therapy and counseling, it's like, ooh, I, you know. And it was just, I think, a very, um, for us, a, an opportunity to give families, kids, teachers, administrators a place to come, not feel judged, throw it all out on the table and start talking about what, you know, let's get real. What is going on in the classroom? What is going on in your home? What is going on behind closed doors? And, um, and then from there, I just, I think it had a lot to do with my mother and myself and the way that we approached it and the people that we hired, we were all in it for the love of, of the job, not to, you know that you mentioned the yeah. the, the term humanistic. Mm. Uh, what does that mean exactly? Common sense. It, it it really just boils down to a common sense approach to in this case parenting. It was, you know, raising kids to take responsibility for themselves. Let the kid climb the tree until they feel unsure and they'll stop. Um, you know, the old, not that we're encouraging kids to put their hands on burners on the stoves, but sure. like, you know, put your hand on the burner and, and you know, if you're going to get burned, you're not going to do it again. It's it's just um, teaching kids just how to advocate for themselves and, and letting kids be kids, letting kids be unstructured, letting kids mm. um, explore and kind of define who they are on their own. Now, that sounds... Um that sounds somewhat intuitive, but it sounds also it's very counter to, I feel like what's been happening, which is this. Right. Oh yeah. Just sheltering the heck out of yeah. kids. Hel helicopter Helic parenting. Well, we've got, I mean, yeah. we've got we, a, a ton <laughs> of that in the book, helicopter yeah. parenting. And, and then we talk a lot about lawnmower parenting, which is really kind of the next Ooh, generation. It's the next generation of, it's, of lawnmower parent, uh, you know, of, um, uh, helicopter. helicopter parenting. And also there's, um, you know, there, there's this whole movement, um, well, helicopter parenting, you all know what that is. You're, you Just know, you're over them all the time. All the time. You're, you're hovering. And yeah. oh, and the bulldozer parenting is the other one that's kind of right. symbiotic too. Lawnmower parenting is you're just, you're paving the way in such a way that there's absolutely no bump in the road for your kid. Right. Uh, you no just, I mean, you just picture, of the, you know, that, that, you know, that backyard, that long, straight, thin, you know, lawnmower yeah. line, and and there's nothing obstructing right. anybody, and that's what parents are doing. They're just bulldozing or removing all the barriers, and, and then they everything. come into my office and they're like, I, "I want my kids to have wings and do something independent and go off to college or manage themselves." And they haven't had adversity, they haven't had obstacles, mm -hmm. they ha don't have the skill set to problem solve, and so. I know we all come from, you know, a place that we love our children. We don't want them to struggle. We want them to have success. But in doing that, it is really problematic for this generation because they really don't know how to problem solve and manage themselves moving forward. And so uh, for us, we're doing a lot of talking around um, being a lawnmower parent and, and how teachers are also impacted by this as well. Um, I don't know if you guys work with any youth, but mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them come in and they expect you to do it for them mm -hmm. and um, help them along in a way that is kind of um, not, not very productive. Do you feel that, this may be a contributor towards the outrage culture we're kind of seeing out there today. I do. When you yeah. say outrage, just, just in terms of like, I'm offended, I'm offended by everything and, and yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the, I think it's just the same mentality that, that parents have who are so pissed off when their kid doesn't get a, a trophy. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, I think, I think, the yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> right. You know, well, you know, my kid, my kid knew that my kid, 
mm-hmm. could, you know, could could do that at home with me while we were studying. What do you mean they they didn't pass the mm-hmm. test? Mm-hmm. And now, statistically, when you look at statistics on on children, there's a lot of measures that seem to be uh, improving or or a lot better. Uh, kids are having less, uh, uh, you know, premarital sex or risky sex. Mm-hmm. There's Drug use seems to be down. Mm-hmm. Um, they less car accidents with children, but they're also they also seem to be more sheltered. Is that a po- are those positive side effects of the helicopter re- parenting, or what are the what are the negatives? I would say that you guys are seeing that need to be addressed with the the, the you know lawnmower parenting or helicopter parenting. Well, the, yeah, they're they're just they're not giving their kids the ability to hit obstacles. They're not. I mean, that's so critical for human beings to have to understand what it feels like to see an obstacle and, and identify what it is and find a workaround, figure it out. Mm -hmm. And if you can't go straight through it, find a way over, under, around, and without the skills and that, that, you know, that, that history of doing that and, and maybe failing and then getting up and, and starting again right. and trying a different path and pivoting. Without the ability to do that, kids are, they're at such a disadvantage because they, they're, they're ill-equipped. They can't, right. you know, it's, it's like we, we have a whole chapter in the book about saying no, how important it is to say mm. no to your kids. It's, it's the same kind of a thing where we're, we're doing too much for them. We're, you know, breeding this, this, generation of you know entitled kids and they, they're just expecting that everything is, is handed right. to them but, in every way but on the flip side of what you were asking is are there benefits and i think i know as parents we want our child to succeed right mm-hmm. we want to our job is to set them up for success and i think that the flip side of that is i know i come from a place where i want my kid to get where they want to go and as a parent, I'm going to make sure that they get where they want to go. And I think a lot of parents think that it means making sure they get the A and not the B. So I work with teachers and the front line of that, and they're, you know, getting a call from, you know, Mrs. Fox saying, hey, you know, why did my son get a B and not an A? And they're saying, well, your child earned a B. And so... In that case, that's where it goes awry. I feel like the parent needs to let the child earn what they worked for. And if they didn't study enough or they got a few wrong, it's okay. Um, So on the flip side, I get why parents are doing what they're doing. And kids are going to wonderful places. They are getting to um, wonderful colleges and and getting into the careers that they yearn for. But uh, you know, at what cost? Like, you know, the scandal in the news right now. At yeah, what right. cost? Yeah, that's that's a tough at thing. At what to cost? Watch. It right. is. And that there's there's a lawnmower parent at its best, right? Um, they're gonna remove any obstacle in the way and and break the law while they do it. So how do we how do we as parents um, manufacture adversity? This is something that I think about a lot now that I have a, a, a newborn mm. and he certainly is going to be raised in a a very different household than I was. And Mm -hmm. I know that as a kid, all the adversity that I went through, I probably went through a time in my life where I was um, uh, angry at my parents because it was so hard or we didn't have things. And and then you go through this transition when you get older and you go like, oh shit, I'm so glad I went through that because it it forged me into who I am today. And so I think about this a lot as I'm raising a, a young one now and going like, man, he's just not going to face any of the same similar challenges as mm-hmm. I had. And I think that's really important to developing his character. So how do I manufacture adversity? You, I don't think you can manufacture. I mean, you, <laughs> I think you tell it, me, you can't manufacture honestly, it. You just allow them to experience it. So just like a simple conflict with a friend, right? I didn't get an invited. I, I didn't get invited or um, I wasn't included. Um, how do you manage that? Is it rejection? Is it I'm not good enough? Is it I'm left out? And so that is not something you have to manufacture. It's going to happen. Yeah. And that child is going to go through some social stuff, some academic stuff that is going to come forward naturally yeah. um, if they're part of a team or as we were talking, part of a band or part of something. 
it really is these things are going to happen. And when the obstacles happen, you need to let them experience it. And well, let's go back to that. That's a, that's a great one that you brought up. And, and I'm, my brain's spinning right now as you said mm-hmm. that. Like, what would I say to my son? He's mm-hmm. been left out, mm-hmm. a birthday party or something. He thought it was his friends. He wasn't mm-hmm. invited. What does that conversation look like? Or what should it look like? Right. I think that it's really important for kids to understand that when someone behaves in a certain way that's their choice and so if a child didn't include them that's that person's behavior and choice that's theirs this is your your behavior your reaction and how you manage it is yours and so helping them understand okay i could take this personally i could take this as a form of rejection or maybe there's more to the story that i don't understand and so it's helping them understand, okay, this happened. How is it landing on you? What does it mean for you? And so it's helping them understand you can meet this with anger and, you know, uh, you know, confrontation, or you can manage yourself in a more productive way and be able to say, okay, I'm going to step back. That's them. If I want an opportunity to do something, I'm going to create the opportunity for connection mm-hmm. and I'm going to create a social encounter for myself. So you're just trying to sort of, coach into how they're going to be able to react to situations like that. That's, that's right. That's the thing. And, and that's a thread. We talk a lot about that throughout the whole book. I mean, that's, that's one of the major pillars in this book. It's really all about how as human beings, we, we are limited to very few things that we can actually fully completely control. <laughs> and one of the things, one of the big things that we can totally and completely control is the way that we act and react to the situations around us and the people around us and the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And and that's something so important to teach your kids. So my my youngest is 19 and my oldest is 22. And we still have these active conversations every day because now they're in the working world and they're, you know, college and you know, there's so many different opportunities when they're not under your roof anymore, where they, they're they faced with all these, these challenges where so much is coming at them. It, it could be a professor, it could be a roommate, it could be someone at their, their job. And they're, you know, they're in a situation where someone's handing them something, um, you know, whether it's a dialogue or whatever it is, and you have to react to it and you have a choice. You know, you can, you can pivot one way, you can pivot the other way. And and it's our ability to manage our own attitude and response. That is one of the most powerful things that we can give to our kids to empower them. Do you think, what do you think about the, you know, everyone gets a trophy Hate it. With it. Hate it. Hate it. Hate it. Makes <laughs> now, why, why is throw it so up bad? in my mouth. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, we, yeah. Hey, we hate it too. But yeah, why? you know what? I, I I think personally, as someone who you know, I played sports all through you know college and high school, and for myself, was never on a team to get the trophy. My my, oh. do you remember my yeah. my school? I, I went to a local private school for a couple of years in our town. We had a losing streak. Our basketball losing streak was like seventy-seven years long. Oh wow! wow. It was that. W- that it was gross. That one win that we had when I was a senior. We had one win, and it was it, there was no trophy. Right. It was nothing. It was just a W, and it was the greatest thing yeah. in the world. It was being part of this unit that's right. bigger than yourself, I, and not I wanna, for a trophy. I think that the generation that we're seeing emerge, the Gen Z kids. Um, are, there's a lack of motivation for a lot of them. And that's because if everyone's getting a trophy, it really doesn't matter how hard you worked, the effort you put forth, the level of commitment you had, because you know, at the end of the day, he's going to get one, I'm going to get one, he's going to get one. And so having athletes that I've, uh, you know, my boys all were athletes through high school and, and even my son, who's a musician, that for them to be part of something or selected for something, that is earning it. That's putting forth effort. Not everyone's going to get the part in the play or in the band or on the team. And they have to learn how to deal with failure. They have to learn how to manage when they don't get what they want. And if everyone's going to get a trophy, well, you're not teaching them that. It dilutes the whole experience. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, yeah. the essence of being a part of a team yeah. is, is being a part of a cohesive group that's working towards something together, that's training towards something together mm-hmm. and experiencing success 
and loss together. And when you all of a sudden are just giving out medals and, and trophies just for showing up, it yeah. dilutes everything. And yeah. the, the essence, if you back it all up and you look at it, you look at it objectively, the reason why we're there is to just show up for one yeah. another and mm -hmm. to show up to play yeah. the sport or to yeah. act in the play or to do yeah. the thing. Yeah, when I think back, um, the, the, the best lessons I ever learned for life were in my losses. Yeah, they, they oh, we talk about that all the time. Yeah, they weren't yes. in my wins. It was when I lost uh, or I didn't right. do well that I learned yeah, the most. I, I yeah. agree. I mean, the losses, I remember <laughs> one of my kids was on a losing baseball team yeah. and he was so frustrated because he just, he was working his hardest. He couldn't, he couldn't control the outcome. And he was so frustrated that he went to a field not far from our home <clears throat> And he screamed. I said, let it out. Scream your brains out. Let it out. Because he was just so frustrated. Instead of getting frustrated with his teammates or getting confrontational or pointing the finger, it's your fault. So it's helping them learn. This feels awful, but you know what? I'm going to take my part and walk off the field and figure out how to manage it. Um, so yeah, through pain is growth. Mm. Yeah. Do you, do you yeah. think if there's a classroom where let's say all the kids got A's, let's say the teacher's teaching history and everybody gets A's, do you think that's a success or do you think that? No, that's nope. pushing a kid it, through his yeah. academics. Yeah. And I see that a lot and I see the kids on the other side of that. And it's, an, it's, it's, um, and it, it's really it's hollow. disjustice. It's, it does them a disjustice because they don't have the skills to earn the A, but they got the A. Yeah. So I, I have a, so I have a son who's very academic. Mm -hmm. uh, he does really, really well in school. I've never helped him with homework because he just seems to, Thumbs and, up. and my, well, <laughs> my worry is that he's not going to have uh, strong adversity in school, and eventually you will you will have adversity, right? Life of course, is at some of point it's going to get real hard. It's inevitable, and I'm afraid that he's not going to know how to handle that kind of challenge because school has been so easy. Now, so now I'm uh, what I've done is I've encouraged him to take classes that stretch him a little bit, and he is getting a little bit of that, and I'm excited to see that he's you know he's getting some of his first B's because it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's it's you know? humbling, and it's yeah. you know, and it's reality too. I mean, you you can't just expect. To have uh, you know a four across the board in your life. I mean, you're not going to get every job necessarily mm. that you yeah. apply to, and you're not going to get picked for every team, and you're not you know yeah. not every girl you ask out is going to say yes, and mm -hmm. you know all all these things. It, yeah. It's my you know we, I keep going back to the you know the wins versus losses, and and I've always felt that that the losses are are where the real magic happens because. That's how you learn to persevere. I just feel it's so crucial to learn that it at is. a young age. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, going on through life, you're going to have relationships, you're going to have business failures, yeah. you're going to have just <laughs> so many things that if you right. if you don't learn uh, those skills to be able to deal with it and move forward and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, get through all that. I don't know how, where you're, else would you learn You know what? That? You're screwed if you don't yeah. have well, those but, skills. But you, that's out of your control. Like you were saying, your, your child has A's mm -hmm. and... I see some kids who come into my office and they're in college and they're getting their first B and it's taken, you know, 13 or 14 years to earn it. So I feel as though when the adversity comes along, it might not happen right away. Use it as an opportunity to learn. They're teachable of, moments. Right. Instead of figuring out, oh, well, the teacher was a hard teacher and that's why I earned the B. Or, you know what? Um, you know, it's my, the, the, it was a group project and not everyone did their part. Your lesson is that you, you know, when the child is earning A is good for him. That's wonderful. And then the day comes when he doesn't, and it's like, okay, what part of this is, um, you know, a difficult part? What is this part? You know, what, okay, well, how did you earn your B? Mm -hmm. Was the content hard? Did you put in enough time studying? Did you understand it? Did you, you know? Um, I feel like sometimes people just sugarcoat things a little bit too much too. Like uh, if, if my kids do worse than other kids at something. Um, I've heard other parents say things like, well, you know, it's okay. It's your thing. And I'll, they'll, you know, my kids will ask me, Hey, why did so-and-so do so much better than me? Or we lost. Well, they were better than you. They were better yeah. than you today. And that's okay. Yeah. yeah. And that you, is okay. You know, maybe they tried harder. They studied harder or sometimes people naturally 
strengths are going to be and better weaknesses. than you. Yeah. yeah, strengths and weaknesses vary across the board. I laugh. My my youngest one wanted to take an AP class this year as a sophomore, and I was like, oh gosh. But he said, Mom, I'm taking it for the subject matter. I want to take this class, and he's knocking it out of the park. Mm-hmm. Whereas other kids who took it for the purpose of the AP might not be doing as well, right? Mm-hmm. They might be earning the C or less because they're in it for a different reason. And so, you know, to your point. What do you guys think about uh, raising kids today in this social media world? And do you think <laughs> that it yeah, is a couple hours. having, so, yeah, a, couple having a huge impact? Do you think yeah, that it's sure affecting it social skills? Absolutely. Like, what, what do you guys see? When, when you say social skills, the very first thing that comes to my mind is my 19-year-old who will try to make plans with friends and they're all on their phones and they're all in different places. And she's, you know, she's 19. She's a grown woman. And they'll, you know, be back and forth about some ridiculous, simple plan that they have for that day. And it's taking them an hour and 45 minutes (laughs) before everyone's responding on the thread and everyone's connecting. I'm like, pick up the phone. Just pick up, pick up the telephone. That's not how we do it in Mm -hmm. my, my generation doesn't do that, mom. That's not what we do. You know, or, or you get back, we talk about this a lot that, um, you know, your kids will text you and, and it'll be all caps and it's, they're yelling at you or, or there's a (laughs) a period at the end. You get that from the boys? If there's a, if you accidentally put a period at the end of a sentence or something that you've written, I'll get another text immediately. Why are you so angry? A period. Oh, like what the hell? That's a new. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Look it up. It's a thing. It's, that's where it's mo- that's how mom thing. used to end sentences growing up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I I think that it, you know just even simply writing the word what what or yep that's what? a big one in my house. You know it, it, it's uh, texting and all of the social media piece. I just I've it's it's very hard to watch it's one dimensional it and that's the problem yeah. there's no inflection there's no you know i'm sitting across from sal sal mm-hmm. knows what i mean when i say something a certain way or because mm-hmm. he sees my face he understands how i'm saying it without that in the absence of that that human contact mm-hmm. you don't know and it's it's all subjective right. and it's all flat it's not only sarcastic you, yeah, yeah. No. It's, Impossible. it's not only yeah. that i i feel like one of the probably the, or what, what i think is one of the scariest things is and we talk about this because we're in the fitness space you know uh, i and i'm guilty of this i have i don't know follow i follow probably thousands of people that are anybody who's into working out in fitness and in our space i tend to follow right and so my feed is just flooded with all these perfect bodies yeah yeah and i know from working in the industry for 20 years and being actually in like brick and mortar gyms and seeing people working out, which uh, already that's a selection bias that you, these are people that are care about their health and fitness. They're in the gym. Mm-hmm. And if I were to look in the gym at all the bodies in there, everybody looks pretty fucking normal. Yeah. Maybe yeah. there's that one or two yeah. people in there that look well, amazing or look like yeah. a, a model or that, it's but everybody else looks the fucking same. Right, so yeah. we, and so as, as these kids and these kids tend to gravitate to, towards these other kids that look amazing yeah. or have amazing things. And so I, I fear that. Like, Yeah, I think that the, the thing that I see is this, just uh, when social media started and Instagram and all of that, I used to have kids that would just be so anxious because they didn't get likes on their yeah. pictures and people weren't acknowledging. Um, and, you know, the whole Facebook frenzy of how what, everyone putting out the perfect images to present a certain way and no one puts out the first thing in the morning or the, uh, you know, not so good outfit that you put together mm-hmm. and looking a little chubby right now, <laughs> not in yeah. shape. Um, but I do, I mean, I, my heart is heavy when I think of social media because I think it's, it's a blessing and a curse because kids are dealing with, like you said, perfection. Um, I think constant contact has just destroyed a lot for kids. I'm not, you know, if a child's being bullied in the school, um, when I was a, in, in school and someone wasn't kind to me, I left the schoolyard and I would go home and it was done for the yeah. day. And now it's not. It follows them home. And if anything, there's more it destruction. It follows them everywhere. Right. And and it's so hard to, you know, watching that. So I'm, you know, the mom of two girls and, and they – They've grown up with social media, not yeah. not as much my older one because it was just emerging when she was coming, you know, kind of into her own. But my youngest, especially, I mean, the hardest thing is is you know you see the pictures of the bar mitzvah and and everybody's there and they're all wearing the matching hoodies and you know they've all they're all in the photo booth and and she's not there and 
well, those are some of my friends. Why am I not there? And then it's 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 just this, you know, this frenzy of activity around whatever event was this weekend and 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 you're not a part of it or you know, it's, it's, you see it. You see it in, in colleges. It's um, you know, kids go off to college now, and and they've been there for three and a half days, and they're already at you know mixers, and everybody's got their solo cup, and they're all you know, mm-hmm. they're they're like forty two kids in one picture. They don't know each other, mm-hmm. but all these kids are posting all these pictures that you know they're they're at their first frat party, and they don't know a single person's name. But to the rest of the world, they're like living large. You know, they're on campus. They've got a huge network, but they don't. And and it's this it's false this fa- yeah, exactly. It's this <laughs> this perception. We see yeah. this in our space. Even I, you know, I we bet. we uh, you know I remember as as the podcast started to grow, um, we began to get more and more connected to people that were insta famous or you know <laughs> yeah. had these massive social followings. And as we would go around and we'd meet them, I only uh, before I met them, my only perception of them is what I had seen on social media and. You know, uh, some of these some of these guys and girls they they do they they take pictures with only other people that are famous or or big, yeah. and then you get to know them and you find out they're extremely lonely. Mm-hmm. But they put on this this perception okay. that they're they're you know hanging out with famous people and they're they're, yeah. and they're and that's all they post. But then when you get to know them, they don't have they one they don't even have a real connection with those people. Right. It was like a take it's, a quick, it's all smoke and mirrors, right. right? And then and then you see that they're actually extremely lonely. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you guys speak to this to to kids I, growing up? Like, what do you what do you say to them? I, I say it a lot, and I think that um, helping kids understand, you know, dialogue and having those conversations with your kids um, is so important. And some kids that I work with choose not to be on social media so that they can retain their own comfort and their own self worth and not feel like they are comparing. So they might not have Snapchat and they might not have Instagram or all of this to uh, preserve themselves because they can't tolerate or know how to navigate. And that brings up the dialogue that I have with a lot of parents, which is giving your kids too much technology when they're not ready for it and being able to say, you know what, kiddo? Um, I'm going (laughs) to, we had flip phones back when we had kids, you know, getting phones and I gave them flip phones on purpose so that they weren't on the internet or getting access to technology they weren't ready to handle. And I unfortunately think that nowadays, you know, iPhones and Androids and all these, they're yeah, you're handing them the world. They're first grade kids, and they've mm-hmm. got iPhone 11s. So they've <laughs> yeah. got. I mean, it's the phone is yeah. bigger than the kid's head, and yeah. it's and they're it's getting what access. they're on all the time. Yeah. Now, the challenge I have is that the technology, social media, mm-hmm. cell phones. This is where kids meet and hang up or yeah. hang out. I should say with yeah. each other. This is how they socialize. Right. So where so where's the balance? Because cutting your right. kid off of technology. Right. It's not like they can go outside and hang out with their with friends. Right. Nobody's outside. Right. Going over each other ho- houses, they don't typically do that as much because they're all on online with each other. <laughs> so how do you how do you balance that out? Because cutting them off is also cutting them off of their friends right. sometimes. It's limitations. It's right. just setting boundaries and teaching them young. Right. That that they're moderation you know, exactly. exactly. So that when there there's a time and a place for it. And so I do think there are certain ages, and we talk about it in the book. I uh, some of my tips kind of help outline ages and technology a little bit and the quantity of it because I I do think that um, you know I work in as young as preschool, kindergarten, going in and helping teachers assess, and kids just don't have the social skills that they need. Simple salutations and eye contact. <laughs> yeah, and, we talk um, a lot about EQ yeah. versus IQ in the book. We have a whole chapter dedicated to it because kids are are losing, they're fast losing that ability to yeah. just to just do this, to just have a conversation with someone and look someone in the eye yeah. or or you know, show empathy. What or, is the difference between EQ and IQ? So your IQ is is your intelligence quotient. It's, you know, how you're gonna perform on the IQ, the written IQ test. Um, and EQ is your emotional quotient. It's your ability to be a good friend, to be a good listener, to have compassion. sympathize and have compassion empathy. and empathy and, and, you know, and, and really be there as a support for another human being who might need it. Um, 
their social skills, mm-hmm. their the ability to sit down and, and have a conversation and not interrupt right. someone, and which you know some of these things seem so basic and fundamental, right. and yet kids can't do it. I mean, there right. are so many but kids. But parents that, can't either. Right. So well, that, right. I'm going to say that dinner time in my house is no phones. Mm-hmm. We do the and same thing. We stack them. We stack them right in the middle of the di- you know the table. Yeah. But parents have to do that too. Mm-hmm. And the bummer. When I when kids come in, I have this one child that I've worked with for years. She wish she wishes that her parents would put the phones down during dinner, mm. and she's the kid. She mm-hmm. just wants to have a conversation. So I I do think when you say okay, you don't want to cut your kid off. Mm-hmm. I get that, but when I was a kid and the phone rang on the wall on the old fashioned phone, my dad didn't answer it. It was not during dinner time that yeah. we answered phones. Sure, and so nowadays it's like. Okay, even though the phone isn't on the wall and it's in your hand, I want you to take it and put it over here. Turn it off. It's okay to tell a friend, I'm not able to talk right now. I'm out to dinner with my family or I'm at home having a Friday night movie night. It's okay to let people know you're unavailable. Do you think that we're just in a transitionary kind of phase where... I, I had a little glimpse of hope because I was talking to some other parents at a party and mm-hmm. um, they were saying that there's this big movement amongst um, a lot of the kids kind of coming up that aren't using phones at yes. all. Yeah, and they're not great. even interested in it. My, my son who just went off to college, he's um, a freshman and he told me, I just saw him a couple weekends ago and he said, I, I'm barely on my phone. Barely. I don't have time for it. I'm not interested. It's boring. And, it's funny because he's not, I you know, no pictures. No, I'm like, hey, what's your roommate look like? You know, I don't see it. I it's feel like, like that's a, a re- that's the the rebellious nature of all children. Yes. And what yeah. it has yeah. to probably be is the parents yeah. are probably so bad on the phones. Uh, yeah. And yeah. the kids growing up being like, I don't, don't want to be, be like that. I don't right. want to be yeah. like that. So right. yes. isn't that and funny? It's yeah. the longevity. I mean, uh, of course, this is the longevity of kids. I mean, I, I, there are some kids that they'll be sitting there and they're, hitting all their Snapchat things to just show that they saw it. And they're like, I have to do this. I'm like, what do you mean you have to <laughs> yeah, do it? Yeah. Oh, well, my streaks and my this and my that. I'm like, it's a chore. Look at you. You look miserable. And mm. it's like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I, you know, and it's so I think the longevity of this, I hope there's going to be a U-turn at some point where people are going to understand um, that, um, you know, our very efficient lives and technology is going to take us backseat to the intimacy of what's so important in our lives today, which is time well spent with people face to face. Now, now you, had, yeah. you had named a few, uh, <coughs> I don't know if you want to call them parenting styles, but you, helicopter mm-hmm. parent, uh, the lawnmower parent, bulldozer, bulldozer parent. are these things that you name in the book are there more yeah, yeah there no those are i think those are the the more common ones i mean the the very first one that was ever coined is helicopter parenting and then bulldozer and lawnmower have have kind of been interchangeable mm-hmm. um, over the years and th- those are the the ones that you mo- you hear most often and in the neg- and what are the neg- cuz we there are you know i had mentioned earlier certain statistics show things are better but then mm-hmm. there's other things that seem to be a little alarming um, i think it was anxieties and depressions <laughs> are seem to be on the rise in adolescence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that a symptom of the helicopter bulldozer type parent style? I, I say anxiety. I think is, so. Well, I think it is. It's a combination of stuff. Yeah. I think it has to do with pressures to perform um, academically. But I also think like we're talking about technology, I think socially and emotionally um, constant contact and social media is creating also an undertone of anxiety that you don't have that many friends or you weren't included in something or I don't look like that, you know? Yeah. And so I think it's definitely a combination. And Lisa and I have done some wonderful lectures at some of our schools to reach a lot of parents around what anxiety actually is, what it looks mm. like, how to manage it and what our role is in helping kids so, so, so something else I've seen, it, it, you know, there was my kid's school, my daughter now, um, she's in a, a elementary school, and they do these like shooter drills where oh, no. they, oh, they yeah. lock the kids and they, they have to get in a certain room and Alice. turn the lights yeah, off. Alice. Um, or, you know, um, I've heard now there's a, there's a term called uh, eco-anxiety where children are anxious over the climate. Um, or over big problems. These are big issues that are super complex for adults to handle. And and little kids, I hear my daughter are getting freaked out about them. Yeah. Do you think we're just over informing them with things that maybe they shouldn't, you know, necessarily be afraid of because it's out of their control? 
Do you think that's an issue? Yeah. I mean, they're definitely saturated with information. Because I never watched the news when I was a kid, but all yeah. of a sudden, our kids, you know, well, think about it's on success their iPhone. right there. I mean, you've up. got alerts coming up all the time. I mean, you can't CNN. get away from it, right? <laughs> it's it's you know, tickers are across your phone and notifications. I mean, you you really can't step away from it anymore. So there is, I think, a real high saturation factor now. And I, I think the the best thing we I was asked this question. Um, maybe a, a month or so ago. And, you know, I think that, you know, how, how do you handle all the negativity that's in the world when you're a parent? I think it's age appropriate. It's like anything else, you know, you're not going to talk to your four-year-old about 9-11, mm-hmm. but you're going to understand and help them understand that there are things in the world that are, are scary mm-hmm. and, and concerning and, you know, that, that you need to, to be mindful of and, um, and give them this, the the tools to to deal with those things as they can handle them, depending on their age. And I think since nine eleven, really, I've been in practice for you know way before nine eleven. And I think that things like Columbine and nine eleven, um, it's induced a certain kind of anxiety I had never seen before in kids and parents. Separation anxiety, um, a child being anxious to be left at school, or a parent anxious to leave their child at school. Um, I do think there is a level of over, inf- you know, over informing for sure. However, you know, it's funny we were having this conversation with my parents. My mom and dad had bomb shelter, you know, practice in their school when they were kids. They had to learn how to crawl under their desk at, in case of That's a bomb. True. Yeah. That's true. That's so, true. Like it would have helped. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> but I do think, fortunate, you know, for my generation, um, we really never went through stuff like that. So we had a fire drill. That was about that it. That was all we ever had. But we have looped back around to a period of time where I do think um, kids are being exposed to things um, like my parents' generation. Because yeah. the irony is, it's, uh, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's far safer today than it was when we were growing up. Uh, uh, kidnappings are, lo- are, are lower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Violence is actually lower. We're not at the threat of thermonuclear war like we were for right. much of the Cold War. But I think the perception's not that. I think if you go out and you take a random group of 100 people and you ask them, hey, was it safer today for you to go play outside by yourself or was it safer back in 1975 or 1985? Most people said, oh, it was way safer back then. Statistically speaking, it wasn't. It, right. It's actually safer today. The perception is 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 off. But it's all relative, too, to mm-hmm. the to the age that we're living in and the issues that we're dealing with nowadays. I mean, we have terrorism now where we didn't. We had, you know, it was the two superpowers that were the big issue and who was going to push the button first. And, um, you know, and, and now we're, we're worried about you know, getting on planes and and well, there were there were terrorists then too. I mean, there were hijackings. There, there we were had 1978 we had, with the hostages. Well, sure, yeah. and we had sure. domestic terrorism. We had mm-hmm. we had several domestic uh, terrorist groups that were performing bombings, and yeah. we had civil rights leaders being yeah. assassinated. Yeah. And I, I feel like we're just terrified, even though it's way safer today. And I think well, that that could be causing issues. Well, I think if you turn on the news, what do we see? I, I can't watch the 10 o'clock news. My husband puts it on and I, that is when I allow mm-hmm. myself to go on my phone mm-hmm. because I cannot tolerate, uh, uh, you know, this one got shot here. This one got hijacked here. Oh, this child was beaten here. I, I think, you know, we don't necessarily hear about uh, enough of the good stuff. Although there is, there is. Well, we tune into uh, yeah. the bad stuff, right? right. We, you we know. do. And, Shock and, value. And, and, and I, I, I don't. I work so hard not to because mm-hmm. what does it do? It heightens your anxiety. It heightens yeah. your fears and, and your worries. And I have kids who have been definitely impacted yeah. by their environment. And so you got to keep, for me, I feel like, again, we're only in control of what we're in control of. So take the you know, management in your own home and determine how much you want to inform your kids. Yeah. Like, like we were using the social media example before mm-hmm. where, you know, it's, it's more rare to see people with six pack abs and in, in statistically than it is to have to, for millionaires. <laughs> people don't realize right, this. They, right. think, they think everybody's got a six pack. The reality is almost nobody does. <laughs> right. But if you're on social media, you know, our primitive brains, what I mean by primitive is they evolved where our minds made judgments based off of what we were around and we placed ourselves in hierarchies and we saw how, okay, I, I, see, I know how tall I am compared to everybody else in the tribe or I see how wealthy everybody is or whatever. But then when you're on social media, now it's like going to a, a like, have you guys ever seen in real life a seven foot tall person? 
I think I have once. My one. my cousin Probably is not. like six nine or yeah. so six eight. It's but super not seven. super <laughs> rare. But if you watch yeah. the NBA all the time, you think huge. you think you yeah. were tiny if you were six foot yeah. three, right? And so I think what happens is you know yeah, kids are much. seeing news happening all over the world, um, and they're exposed to, and so their brain perceives it as this is my neighborhood. Yes, yeah, this is the norm. This yeah. is what's going on. Oh my gosh, this is really scary. When when you actually. They did a study, it's a famous study uh, years ago when uh, Jaws came out and public perception of shark attacks skyrocketed. Everybody yeah. thought shark attacks and newspapers were reporting shark attacks. Everybody thought, oh my gosh, everybody's getting attacked <laughs> by sharks. Shark attacks are extremely consistent year, yeah. year over year. They don't go up, they don't go down. They're, but our perceptions made us feel terrified. And I feel like that that may be happening a little bit with with kids just because they're like over informed with stuff that's really complex. Well, they're, I think they're over informed with stuff for sure, but it's also social media has done this incredible thing. It, it's reduced the size of the world. Totally, it's, it's yeah. we're we're all yeah. we're all right in the thick of all of it together. What's going on in Syria? What's going on in anywhere in Europe? I mean, it, 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 all over the world, places that were just so far removed from our life and our our you know our lens are now on top of us 24 hours a day so it's it's like we're kind of carrying the weight of everything that's happening around us and our kids are doing that and they're internalizing that and i think our generation um you know for for instance Debs and my generation we, you know you're hyper in tune to it and then your kids are hyper in tune to it. And there's a total trickle down effect totally. in parenting. And that's, you know, that's another thing we talk a ton about in the book is that we're modeling all this stuff. Like you guys are modeling this for your kids. We're modeling for our kids and, yeah. you know, how they see us handle conflict and, and adversity and, and the good stuff. And, um, you know, our relationship with our spouse, I mean, and our friendships, they're watching everything. They don't. Mm -hmm. They don't miss a thing. But it's like that old, you know, that old saying: whatever you think your kids are capable of, they're actually capable of so much more. Mm -hmm. It's it, the same thing goes for what they're observing. They mm -hmm. take everything in. So, um, what's the most? Uh, I guess it, would you consider be more of the more important chapters in the book? One where you think that is going to really make <laughs> kind of the biggest impact on on well, people. For me, when I looked at the book um, towards the end, it's um, walk the walk and talk the talk. Yeah, talk the walk. Yeah, blah, blah. You get the point. Talk the talk and walk the walk. Um, I think uh, to go off of what Lisa was just saying, which is I do think that you need to be really careful about pointing a finger and saying, my child, when people call me and say, oh, my eight-year-old is having a problem and da-da-da-da-da, will you work with them? They're not behaving in the home and they're not listening to me. Um, I often sit with the parents first. What is going on in the home? Mm. What is the behavior management like there? Are there rules? Are there limits? Or is this child just showing you that they're having a hard time because there aren't any clear expectations or rules and so it's really, in my opinion, really important. Is it ever the kid? Um, is it yeah. ever, right? Honestly, Honestly is it? Like, it I went, is. Sure is it? it is. Absolutely. Sure it is. And so what 50, it then 50. turns into is parents putting in place behavior management in ways that the child understands. There's expectations, it's concise, and there's a system in place. So for me, I do feel as though... It, for parents, if you don't want your child on your their phone twenty four seven, you can't be on your phone. Lay it down. You've got to walk yeah. that walk. And and yeah. the other thing, one of my favorite, well, one of my favorite lines in the book is, "We've got to hold the line." That's what we have. That's our job as parents. It is so difficult to you know to hand out that consequence or um, to to maintain that presence when you, you just want to be soft and you, you want to give in. And the, the most, I think, one of the most important things that we can do in the way that we model our behavior is to follow through, be consistent. Mm -hmm. If X happens, well, then Y is going to happen. And you're responsible for that. So we have to follow through and kind of 
lay it down and keep it consistent. Right. Talk this, is cheap. This kind of That's right. That's this right. kind of it means is. you have to be careful when you set the the, the consequences. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, oh, like, hey, I, if you do that, you're grounded for a year. Uh, right, you right. Stick to it. <laughs> yeah. I can't tell you how many times yeah. that I like you know your kid really just pisses you off, especially when they get older and they just they just like nail you from all sides and and you you just you get so fret, fed up and you just lay it down like you're not using the car for two months and then they they're like well I guess you're gonna get up and drive me to work and <laughs> pick me up at the train and da da da, da you know and yeah. and then you're like damn it damn it and <laughs> Dave will look at me and be like, what did you just say <laughs> you know yeah but, that that is a picking I call it the good stuff list my parents are like what do you mean well you create a list of stuff that your child likes. You know, some yeah. good stuff, going out with friends, um, buying something off of the internet, um, whatever their good stuff is, screen time. And you look at that good stuff list and sadly you use it to your advantage so that when something does happen and you set the term, you set the expectation. And then if it's not met, then, you know, when they're little, it's then you're going to lose a story. You're only going to get two, not three. And when it's 10 years old, it's sorry, you're not going to get your Xbox time. You know, and when it's 15 and 16, 17, it's sorry, you're not going to be able to go out Friday night or, you know, you're not going to be able to take the car. And so it's learning what matters to them. And I always have a saying with kids, you earn a reward, but you also earn a consequence. Yep. So you pick. If you don't want to do it, you earn this. And if you want to do it, then you earn that. Mm. My parents were horrible at this. They, uh, they, thought, <laughs> they thought they were supposed to be consistent with the discipline on all of us on what they took away or how they punished. Yeah. And so like the, the, the overarching thing for the whole family was, you know, you do something wrong, you're grounded to your room. Well, that fucking tortured me because I'm a social, <laughs> social. kid yeah. and I could hear the kids playing outside and it just like it was like nails on the chalkboard and I'd cry in my room all day. My sister, on the other hand, is extremely introverted, loves to sit in her room and play with her dolls all <laughs> right, day long. Right. So punishment was yeah. like it fucking but, was nothing for her. Right, but that's right. a really good point because every child needs something different. Mm -hmm. And I, we talk about that in the book that what you I have three boys. They are very different. What motivates them is different. <clears throat> what um, is meaningful to them is different. And so when you're thinking about a consequence or a reward, it's gonna you you need to tailor it to each child because it really is like you said, perfect example. Like yeah. you being locked in your room. It's and your a, sister. It was a wasted on yeah, her. Yeah, completely, yeah, completely wasted. Maybe on her. she set herself up. Yeah. So no, she, she was be, grounded. She'd be grounded for a day. She'd <laughs> yeah. stay in there for another day. Yeah, it didn't fucking matter to yeah, her. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it is important to tr treat each kid um, differently because they all need something. Different. Now you got yeah. you guys go around and you you lecture a lot, and so mm -hmm. you obviously get a lot of feedback from other parents. Yeah. What do you think is what do you think the, the hardest thing for you guys to communicate is to these parents? Like, what do you keep hearing? And it's like, we try it, we say this and I feel like I have to like a broken record. Well, for, for me, it's uh, the be gentle to yourself. Yeah. I think that um, the title of the book is so important to look at because our children aren't perfect and neither are we. And if we, and more importantly, when we make a mistake, it's not awful you have to loop around and find a way to repair the mistake. So if you said something, you did something, you behaved in a way that you're less than happy with the outcome, you have every opportunity, as long as you take it, to loop around, come back to your child and explain. I'm sorry I raised my voice. I'm sorry I swore. I'm sorry I, you know, <laughs> dumped your drawers out on the middle of your bedroom floor. But this is what got triggered in me. This is what happened to me. I'm sorry. However, I got to this point because. And so it's repairing that. And so for me, I just can't impress upon parents enough that you are human. You will make mistakes. We drop balls. We drop We're balls. We're supposed to drop balls. God, that, that's, such, that's such a good point. Uh, Self-compassion is really important. Sal, Sal shares a story on the podcast. He's, he's talked about a couple times. One of the first times that he came unglued in front of his in, in yeah. front of both of his kids and uh, it was because somebody threw a black basketball at the back window of his car as he's driving by and his daughter was in there and he pulled over and 
who got out and fucking chased the kids, slammed the basketball hoop, and just gorilla dad came out <laughs> protecting his daughter, right? Which I think every and Sal's not a small guy, right? And everybody so that's probably intimidating, you know, thinking of that going like, fuck yeah, I would do the same thing too. But then he gets back in the car, and you know, the other, the other, his son is kind of scared, and you know, why did you do that, dad? And dad explains that well, they endangered daughter or whatever, and son goes, well, don't you think you put us in more danger by pulling over yeah. and doing that? And I think that the the biggest lesson in that story is when at the end of it he talks he apologizes you were right you know i i, I did make a mistake and i i, I acted out and should, and I, and I, when he tells it's that story yeah. right when he, when he tells <laughs> that story i think what, what what hits home for me is i you know I, I remember my parents probably making a lot of mistakes growing up i don't have a lot of memories of them coming to me and admitting that they made mistakes and i feel like uh, so many parents have that that ego issue where they you know, they say something or do something. It's like, oh, because I'm the parent. And even if they fuck up yeah. and they go over a line, they don't they don't think that they can come back and say, you know what? Even though you're the child, you're right. I but was But that's wrong one here. of the most important things that we can do for our, our kids is to show them Not that we're right. fallible. Like we can screw up. We can drop balls. We can rally and and recover and apologize and acknowledge that's that's one of the yeah. things. Just own it. That's that's yeah. a big chapter in the book. That's one of my favorites. Is that yeah. we we need to own these behaviors ourselves, the good ones and the bad ones. But you also want to nurture in your kids to find their voice as well. So if you do or say something, I remember a big lesson I learned. My oldest son, I think he was probably about seventeen. Um, he had left the laundry down in the laundry room and I asked him nicely once, can you just bring it up to your room? After about the third time, I flipped and I was like, bring up your damn yeah. laundry. That's like a daily thing you know? in my house. And so he looked at me and he, and, and he said, mom, when you yell at me, I really don't listen. It really is upsetting. And I looked at him and I took a deep breath and I walked away and I caught myself. And then I looped back around and I said, you know what? Thanks for letting me know that. But, I'm yelling because I've asked you three times. Is there any value in that for you to understand that? Yeah, no, I, I get it. But thanks for apologizing because it, it really, I don't like when you scream at me. Now pick up your fucking laundry. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. but, right. but what it teaches kids is mutual respect, which as they grow older at that, you know, when they're older teens, you need to have mutual respect. And if you don't have it, they're not going to listen. Oh, I now. think you got to let yeah. your kids hold you to the same standards. I, I, had, right. I had a time when, you know, I, I was taking my daughter somewhere and I did something and I said shit and I get in the car and she's like, you know, Ooh, you know, I heard you say a bad word and I'm still kind of upset. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm an adult. Yeah. I can say bad words. You're a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you shouldn't be saying those, you know, real, real quiet for a little while. And she goes, yeah, but you probably still shouldn't say bad words in front of little kids. <laughs> And I said, you're right. That's Check for her. Yeah, I said, you're, you're 100 for her. I said, I apologize, right. and you're 100% you're right. 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 Yeah. I think that's that's real important. My, my, my parents were both pretty good at that. My mom yeah. would do that. She'd sit me down and apologize for doing something. And I'd only increase the amount of respect. Right. Um, well, that's that I had the thing. For, I, that it does breed respect because, you know, you're, you you're admitting that you're human. You're admitting that you can't get it right 110% of the time. And you're acknowledging your own behavior and how it may have impacted the people around you. It's but big. you know what's important too for kids to understand? I'm all about empowering them and helping them find their voice. But when you ask them what they're thinking or how they're feeling, it's wonderful that they share it. But it might not, uh, you know, impact the outcome. You know, I still wanted him to take down the laundry. Sure, right, right. You know, yeah. bring up his laundry. Yeah. Right. Um, so, you know, I really appreciate that you don't like when I yell at you. But you know what? Let's stop. Let's go back to the the issue here and that is go get your laundry and so kids i want them to you know let them say i didn't like that or that upset me or i got hurt by that it's really important for them to feel heard mm. but now, in your in your practice deborah were there did you see common challenges that moms would have versus dads did you see because we're all fathers in here mm -hmm. and i i you know there's a lot of I mean, let's to be quite honest. Yeah. Uh, if there's far more single moms than single dads out there, mm -hmm. uh, and, and yep. we're all very involved with our children's lives. We find a lot of advice mm -hmm. given to parents, not a ton of advice to dads. Are there common like challenges you see with moms and dads, or is it all kind of the same? I th I think for the most part it's the same, but I I think. Um, each situation is, you know, can be very different. 
Um, I work with a lot of dads and moms. Um, and I think one thing that I find dads challenge with the most probably is the, the, the communication, the communication styles, um, and how they kind of navigate their way to loop back around and apologize, um, or to stop and gain a perspective. Um, I just intuitively, I think women and I glow, I'm being generalizing, but we're a lot more, um, empathetic. emotional yeah, and we empathetic. wear it on our sleeves yeah. most of the time. And I, I'm going to tell you, there have been plenty of empathetic dads in my office as well, um, that are are just incredibly intuitive and incapable. But I do find in, in general terms that for dads, I help them slow down and listen. Um, I think just because of how, um, and living in a house full of men is all I've ever done. I have brothers. <laughs> she I have she three only boys. speaks boy. I only I, speak I speak girl. boy. I mean, you know, I do and I get it. And I think um, built differently, you know, testosterone brings as agitation and frustration, reactivity in a different way than maybe a mom, um, uh, a young lady. And so it's learning how to manage that, your makeup a little bit differently. I wanted to talk a little bit more in that direction. And we had Dr. Warren Farrell on the show mm -hmm. and he talked a lot about the benefits and, and of rough and tumble play yes. and of, uh, I actually had the fortunate uh, ability to put my kids in this like play school where they actually like instituted this, this whole area designated to rough and tumble play and with boys mm -hmm. and girls. Mm -hmm. And they all had like somebody managing it. So it didn't get mm -hmm. out of control, but I just thought that was such a great outlet for yeah. them yeah. because I just don't find that physicality, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being allowed anymore in schools and to really like uh, it's not. get, you're get that about, energy out. I, you're talking to someone who was putting a full Nelson by her little right. brother. I mean, you know, I get it. Right. Um, I think that it, it also is an opportunity for kids to be able to say enough. Exactly. Yes, draw yes. the line yes, the and, boundaries, the boundaries. Right? and understand yes. how to speak right. for themselves and, that way. And so, you know, I'm all about whether it's rough and tumble play or any kind of play. I, I do. I think it's just breeds an opportunity to be able to say, hey, look, you know what? I don't like when you do that. Or, mm -hmm. you know what? My brother held the pillow over my face for too long. You know, could you please, <laughs> you know, please say, you know, take it off my head. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I, I agree with that. And I think it's, it makes it okay to be rough and tumble. Um, boys are rough and tumble, a lot of them. And so are girls, which is the worst, you know. Oh, I think it's great. Totally. I, I, yeah. I wrestle with my daughter all the time. And I think it's good because... Yeah. Like you said, she knows when she's going too hard. I'll tell her, hey, don't poke in the eye or don't hit too hard or whatever. Don't bite her Or nails. we're not going to keep doing this and she'll stop. So she learns that. But she also learns that she can be physical with a man and it not be, you know, inappropriate. She knows her body. But, you know, dad, don't push me here or oh, don't twist my leg or whatever. It, it's 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 between her, you know, me and her, mm -hmm. and it helps her be comfortable with herself. I oh, think that it's a, so important. That a man can be physical with a girl and not be sexual. That's right. right. That's right. 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 Yeah. Absolutely. And she can develop that voice that allows her to say, no, no, that was that mm -hmm. was too much. Totally. Yeah. totally. Or that hurt. Or, Absolutely. I think yeah. it's too much. Now, what about partners? Because raising kids uh, oftentimes involves two people, um, you know, or, or more. <laughs> What about the communication between partners and in, in doing so? Because I think sometimes there's different Parenting. ideas of where structure should be placed or where there should be lines. How important is the communication between? It's huge. I think yeah. I think having open lines of communication and 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 being kind of symbiotic in the way that you communicate. You know, if if you're going to lay it down about something your daughter's not allowed to do, and then all of a sudden she creeps over to mom and she kind of you know plays the room right. and. And tries to you know, get, get mom to flip. Like you have to, there has to be a cohesiveness. Right. Like you're not, a, you're not supposed to agree on everything. We're, we're right. never, well, no we're gonna, relationship will. What, what's important to my husband and his priorities are oftentimes different than mine. So he wants things done a certain way or in a timely way. And me, I parent differently and we parent very differently. And it's through the years, it's a lot uh, around communication, but also with your kids to be able to say, look, if dad told you to do that, go do it. Now, I might not think it's an important thing that they have to go and do, but you know what? Your dad asked you to go help him in the yard, go help him in the yard. 
and now he wants you now. Mm. Um, so I, I do think um, I work with, uh, it's a, a large part of what I do is family work, communication, parenting. And I think one, uh, the biggest issue is that we all bring our legacy into the room, how we were parented, what we witnessed, what we experienced, and that then develops a lot of how we parent. And mm -hmm. so I think it's important. I did not grow up in the same home as my husband. So he brings different styles and techniques to the table. And I think as long as they're, they're safe and respectful, you know, you need to create space for each of you to parent the way that it's you a collaboration. It's it's like any relationship is whether you know whether it's a work collaboration or a friendship. You're, you know, you're always going to do things in in a slightly different way, and and sometimes in a in a more obvious way that's different from your partner. But it's understanding how to create and maintain respect for each other. And we we've always had something in our house my, between my husband and I where if one of us was kind of neutral about a situation or a decision and and the other was like really really adamant and we could kind of you know back that up and we had a very strong opinion we we the other one would kind of defer to that and 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 vice versa and you know you're not always going to be in complete sync but it's no. <laughs> it's you won't i mean you're i mean you're lucky if you're almost ever in complete yeah. sync but you you do your best to hear what the other person is saying and to understand what's important and to, and to understand what the other person, your partner's strengths and weaknesses are. You know, there's certain things that, you know, that I know Dave is way better at doing than, than I am. And I've learned so much from him because he's the one who will see the cues when my daughters, one of them in particular needs me to leave the room or, or needs him to leave the room. Like we've, we've hashed something over and over and over again. And, and, Dave's really great about saying, okay, I'm going to come back and, and we'll talk again when you've calmed down or you have a different mm -hmm. state of mind. And it's taken me a long time to do that because I'm the one who just wants to, you know, get in there and and let's pick it apart and let's find out what's going wrong and, and let's put it back together and make it work and fix it. And and sometimes you can. And so, yeah. you know, you you collaborate with one another and, and you kind of bring each other's yeah, you know, I think it's important to, to to show like a united front. I, yeah. I, I, you know, my my kids live in two households. I'm I'm divorced, uh, but their mom and I are, work together um, quite a bit in raising the kids. Yeah. And I also have a, a partner that I live with, mm -hmm. and so we work together. And so I, it's like, and it makes it more difficult. You know, my oh, kids. Sure. Of course, it you know, does. and so I'm I'm constantly checking like, hey, you know, mm. our son said that he goes to bed at this time with you. <laughs> is this true? No, it's not. Okay. Four hours later. Yeah. And so it's like, I, cause I want yeah. them to see, but then when we have a disagreement, I try and do it away yeah. from well, the kids. Cause I want yeah. them to think that we're united. Blended you know? families. I work yeah. with more than ever now. And I think that um, it is hard. I help parents back up and draw a line and know where their boundary is. So when they're over at moms or they're over at dads, yes, there are things you need to be in sync around, um, especially when children are young, very young, because they don't know any better or any different. Mm -hmm. um, and so when they're hungry, they're hungry. And if they're used to eating at this certain time or around this certain time, you know, see if you can make it work. Of course, it's not going to be perfect. But as kids get older, they do. They can, oh, well, dad said it was fine if I did that. <laughs> Mom's saying, oh, really? They don't think we talk is the thing. <laughs> that yeah. Dave and I will crack up about it all the time. And as old as our kids are, they literally think we don't communicate with each other. <laughs> yeah. And we're clueless. Yeah, the other day, uh, my, my, my son's 14. He's a good kid, but he had one of those teenage moments and he... Gotta love him. Him and his mom got into it. I don't remember what it was over. Oh, he didn't do his chores. And so she took away his uh, his electronics. And so he's really, really upset. And they're going back and forth. And he said, well, I'm just going to go stay with dad because he lets me do ah. whatever I want, which isn't true. But it really, really hurt her feelings. Yeah. Um, and so she told me. And I, when he came to my house, I took him aside. And I had that conversation. And I said, you know, it really hurts your mom's feelings to say something like that. Um, because I want him to know that I support her mm -hmm. and it, her and I aren't the greatest of friends or anything, but um, it's for the kids' sake, I want them to see that we're mm -hmm. working together. Um, is there any information that you hear being communicated in terms of raising children that is considered true or you know common knowledge that you think is probably not that true? Is there anything that's that you know the counter <laughs> maybe actually the truth? 
I I think mm. it's right around making a mistake. Yeah. They're ruined. Yeah. You know, oh, pa- yeah. Parents come in and go, oh, my God. Uh, I, you know, and especially in blended families. Mm. Right. Oh, their father's ruining them. Mm. You know, he not doesn't care about homework and this and that. But I, I, I don't I think that, again, it's all about repair work. OK, so if if you think dad's ruining him, you know, what do we have to stop, look at, slow down and repair? And what, you know, do we need to have a conversation? Do we need to have a family meeting? What do we have to do? So for me, um, mine is, um, you know, oh, they're ruined. They're not. We have a whole lifetime to repair and make them the best that they can be. Yeah. 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 My, 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 my partner, she, she did such a good job of communicating this to me. One of my kids did something and I wanted to go fix it or prevent them from making a mistake. And she said, let them screw up now because it's better they screw up now than when they're adults. And I that's thought, oh right. yeah, I guess that's because we're a there. Good point. We're there to help them navigate through that. And it, it doesn't by any means mean that we're there to come in and and find the solution or implement the solution or handle it for them. We're we're there to help them navigate. And and that's why this is that time when they're under our roof and they're, you know, they're they're more apt to take in our influences. And our suggestions, it, 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 you know, we need to be there to support that. Right. Mm. She's she's smart in saying that. I do this that metaphor. I learn quickly how what kind of parent I'm working with, and quickly ask, you know, if your child is standing in front of a puddle, um, are you the kind of parent that's gonna say to the child, "Oh, don't go in the puddle," um, and kind of carry them over the puddle, or are you the parent that says, "Oh, don't go in the puddle," and keep walking, and if they fall in the puddle, you're on the other side of the puddle to be there if they need help getting up, mm, yeah. right? So are you the one who's going to prevent them from going in the puddle or are you going to be there to help them if they need it? Mm. Yeah, admittedly, and, I'd be the one to pick them up. And, uh, right, yeah. and the dilemma, that so that's like um, a budding lawnmower parent, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So that you want them, yeah. you know, if they fall in the puddle, they're not going to die. Mm. They're going to get wet. Mm-hmm. But it's I'd rather them see the impact of their choice. Mm-hmm than for you to prevent them from having the impact because they're going to go ahead and do it again until they have the impact of the behavior. Now, so. I, I've, I've found that a lot of times when somebody writes a book about a topic or you've worked in the field for so many years, sometimes you are the ones that have uh, the greatest adversity or struggles in your own home. Mm. And I would love to hear from each of you, what are the challenges you have with each of your kids mm-hmm. and how have you overcame it? Wow. Um, well, let's, we'll, we can start with the most recent one. Um, <laughs> so so my, my youngest, and I, I don't even know if I'd classify it as a challenge. You know, I'm sure it is on the scale, but so my youngest is 19 and she had two radically different kids. My oldest just graduated from, Boston University and, you know, super motivated and and did all the things and took advantage of everything and groups and clubs and all that and um, has kind of everything paved in a, in, in a direction that she's, she's really excited about. And my youngest was never a kid from probably grammar school on who thrived in school and enjoyed school. It was difficult for her. She was challenged. She, we, we, discovered that she had a learning disability when she went late in the game, like seventh grade. Um, so she just was not an academic kid and, and went through high school the same way. And, you know, and, and, you know, you, you want to give your child everything that you have the ability to give them in terms of opportunity and, and skills and, um, you know, a base. And so naturally the way that our society perceives kind of the growth of our children is you, you raise them, they go through school, they go off to school, and then they figure out what they're going to do from there. And and I guess for me, um, you know, we, we always knew that she was hesitant to go off to college and didn't know if if it was her thing and wasn't vibing it at all and and wasn't engaged and, and really wanting to do it. And she, but she surprised us and she went through the whole process and she applied to schools, got into everything and went to a school one semester, wasn't for her came home, shocked us again and applied to another school closer to home and went there and again, just was like, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know where I want to be. I don't know if school is even for me. And, and we struggled with that for a while. It was like, you know, you've, you're already in it, uh, you know, for a year. You, you can move around again, find another place that maybe suits you a little better. It's not cookie cutter. 
And and it took a while for us to get to that point where we were like, okay, you know what? She she said, she put it to us in interesting terms. She's like, look, I've been in school for 13 years of my life. I have no clue what the hell I want to do with my life. I know that I don't thrive in this environment. I want to be in that space and time in my life that comes after school. I want to be in the job. I want to be working. I want to be producing. I want whatever it is. And so, you know, that was a really big challenge for us, for me in particular, was to say, okay, you know what, you're you're 19 years old, you gave it a try, and now I'm going to practice what I preach, which is that mm, it's not okay a that. one size fits all world for any of us. Forget about like the whole parenting game. I mean, in general, in life, there is not one size Definitely. that fits all. Yeah. And so, for me, that was a big struggle, and and for Dave, just letting her drive that bus, which is, we talk a lot about that too. That that that's one of the biggest gifts that we can give our kids is to let them just to, to move over and let them kind of take the wheel and, and navigate. And this was one of those times and it was a challenge and, and she found herself an incredible job and she's a full-time nanny for this great family and doing a ton of different things. And now she's came to us and she's thinking, maybe I might go back and take some classes. Mm -hmm. And so she kind of came around, we, we let it be and, and she kind of came around to it, but it was a challenge to begin with. And mm -hmm. we just kind of stayed unified and trusted her and here we are. So yeah, good deal. Yeah. I think that if somebody said they didn't have a problem, they'd be lying. Yeah. Of course. Of <laughs> yeah. course. Right. That's why I had so, to ask. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think that everyone has something. And I think for me, um, kind of a, uh overarching thing for me as a parent is when I see my child making a decision or a judgment that is less than perfect and being able to stay on the sidelines yeah. and be an observer and let them see that poor decision through and watch it impact them in a bad way. What does that look like? It I mean, is, like, hard. Give, me, give me, give me an it's example. Just, it's just, give me an example of like the last, like, yeah. uh, Oh fuck. Yeah. He's going to, this is going to hurt, yes. but I'm going to. Yeah. I mean, I, I think part, part of it is, um, like I, I think of academics, for example, like with my youngest, um, I have two of three kids. One has ADHD and one has ADD. And um, both very brilliant kids, um, but didn't have the executive functioning that was matching their mm -hmm. intellect. Um, and so we, um, one one of them, their behaviors were getting in the way of their learning. And so we ended up getting him tested and learned he was this very bright kid who was very bored and <laughs> distracting and distracted and um, had some organizational issues. And so at a very young age, um, had to begin managing that with him. And now I think the harder part is letting him manage it on his own. So for example, stepping back his first semester of college, he um, decided maybe I don't need my medication that I've been using. And we, hey, he's you know 18 going off to college. It's a decision that you have to make. And um, he went through a really tough time of academic output and it wasn't going so well. And I just simply asked, Hey, have you taken your medication? No. And I was like, huh, what do you think? Huh? So second semester, he had taken a break. He was home. We sent him back with his medication and he started taking it and noticed what it was like off it, what it was like on it. And so now he's really become a much better uh, navigator in regards to his own um, medication and when he needs it and when he doesn't. But it was really hard. And so we're going through this with my youngest, who is, again, a really bright kid, ADD, not ADHD. And so he's um, got a little bit of a different thing going on. But freshman year medication really impacted him. He's my creative kid, the musician we were talking about earlier. And he didn't like who how he felt and who he was. And he's this year we started and he goes, I'm, I'm not going to take it. I said, all right, I have to stop. I know what a medication does for him, but I'm not a pull, pill pusher. And so, you know what, I'm going to have to step back and all, all the things I knew, organizational details, not writing assignments down, not turning them in, all of these things just were flooding in the front of my brain and I thought you know what he's a sophomore in high school I gotta let him 
navigate this. And so I step back and he, I think, is working harder than he ever has because he wants to succeed off it. And so, yes, has he um, maybe dropped a ball or two? Yes, but he's learning how not to do that. Um, although, again, we're perfectly imperfect, so he's going to drop them and being okay with it. Um, so, how does it look and how does it feel for a parent? It is hard. It sucks. You have to breathe through it. it. You have to remind yourself that um, eventually he's going to need his own wings. And if I'm the one kind of uh, navigating the way, he's never going to grow them. Uh, on the topic of ADD and ADHD. Yeah. And, tough one. And yeah. a parent. So I, um, Repeat that. I wasn't paying attention. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That was good. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you did there. That yeah. was a but um bum. Yeah. <laughs> Dad joke. Yeah. And uh, you know, being a parent that has two kids that uh, are challenged with this, do you come from the camp that uh, this is on an incredible rise right now, mm -hmm. or has this been something that's been around for many years, and we're just now starting to diagnose kids? Yes, and also. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's something environmentally that is impacting uh, them to for this to be seem mm -hmm. almost exaggerated now? It's so crazy yeah. the amount of kids that it's are like being like everyone's diagnosed. being diagnosed um, with right. it. Yeah, I think we've just found a name for a be for a system. So there are different parts to ADD, ADHD, and a very big part of it is what we call executive functioning, um, and what we're learning in our teaching through in schools is that there are ways to test and understand when a child isn't organized or missing assignments or not rushing through their work and not getting things right, there's names for that now. Whereas back when I was a kid, you were sloppy, you were irresponsible, you sure. were lazy, yeah. you were all these things. Um, now there's just, you know, fortunately ways of uh, evaluating a child's performance. And so being in schools, if a child starts flagging, I call it red flag, um, that he's not turning in assignments or paying attention to detail or things like that, we red flag it. And then they go through a system of being tested to then understand. And I'm from the camp of knowledge is power. If a child is struggling with these things, I don't necessarily worry about the label, but I'm going to work with them to build a toolbox and a skill set to then manage what it is we've learned as a deficit for them. So um, I, I'm all about understanding if a child is, um, like one of my kids has uh, like a really low active working memory, which means if you ask him to put his name on a paper, number it one through 10, and then, um, you know, fold it in half and uh, put your pencil down, he's going to get maybe one or two of those things, but not all of them. And so knowing that, I'm going to help him understand he has to self-advocate. Like you just said, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. I, I didn't, you know, can you repeat that? It's helping them then understand, yeah, I need to self-advocate and ask, okay, I only got the first two parts of that. What's next? And helping teachers understand it's not a child being irresponsible or lazy. It's a child who does struggle with memory and retention. Mm -hmm. So I, I, uh, is there any fear for you as a parent, uh, the addictive properties that come with things like mm -hmm. Adderall and mm -hmm. Ritalin. So Huge. I, yeah, I, sure. th just a little personal story myself. Pers I never uh, experienced Adderall, Ritalin, any of those drugs until I got into my mid thirties and um, holy shit, they're awesome. <laughs> and, and, and why they're probably awesome for someone like me. And I think Sal can probably speak to this too, is um, I believe I, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Right. And Speed. I, and I also believe that I, so I've, I just grew up not, you know, being bored in school. If I applied myself, I crushed. I was an A student. If I loved the class and I was into it, if I wasn't, I could easily fail the damn class. Um, even in my success in work, I, I found really early on that um, if it was something that I was into and I, and I liked, I crushed. If, I, if it was something like I, organization and, you know, crossing the T's, dotting the I's and ugh, I mean, I just would just ignore it and not do it. And so... I spent most of my life tr trying to figure out ways to create better habits, behaviors, to develop these skill sets, also focusing on the things that I'm already good at so I would become great at it, not worrying about the things that maybe I'm not very strong in. And so I've had to teach myself how to do that. And because of that, I think that I I've had a lot of success in my life of overcoming some of those challenges. 
Um, but I, I have, and again, I've dabbled with using these things and I'm like, holy shit. If I take, if I have to, like, for example, we have to write a lot of content in this business and we, if we got to sit down and I got to write a ton of content, boy, if I take one of those, I mean, I can, it's, I'm on fire, but that I'm also a very self-aware person and go, whoa, uh, this is so awesome that I could see myself taking more and more yep. and more. Yeah. Is there any fear of that? There's always, oh, a, yeah. I think there's always a fear of that. I mean, I have a daughter who, you know, both of my daughters as well have uh, ADD and my oldest, the one who just graduated, found out maybe only two years ago when she was in college that she had ADD and, and as a result went on medication. And, and it, it, there was a whole journey involving that, that piece of, you know, of her life, just finding the right medication and, and what wound her up or, or what really mellowed her out and didn't work and, and caused you know, kind of personality changes. And, um, you know, she definitely went through uh, a whole process of trying to find the right one. And once she did, she she got to that point where for her, like you're saying, it's it was an awakening. She was like, holy crap. I, it's like I flipped this switch and all of a sudden I have the capacity to do these things that that I couldn't do before. And it's liberating and it's exhilarating. And, and yeah, you, you know, you definitely, as a parent looking at a child, medicate like that you definitely worry that that mm. oh my god so my know, question can they was, function without it yeah. right my question to right. myself was is it was this something that i couldn't do before or i'm just challenged yeah i i think that I, i'm a believer that oftentimes medication can drive a diagnosis which means that for someone who is an add and it's t is taking that medication it has a different feel and a different impact than for the person who's taking it for the purpose mm. and so for people who are just taking it and not technically struggling with any of these things and a lot of college kids take it and it's speed <laughs> right <laughs> they're yeah. they're racing their brain whereas someone who has ADD ADHD their brain needs the speed to to actually bring the brain activity the, the activity up to a certain level so that they don't need any more distraction or stimulation so for them it's a different feeling it's a different experience and um it's used in a different way now for yourself you know it's it's a very adderall is probably one of my least favorite medications i have one son who will take it um periodically when there's as um, needed as yeah. needed which is my youngest one and i think that um it you have to be very aware of the side effects and it's good dialogue to have. I sat them down. I'm like, if you're going to use this, this, if you ever feel these things, I want to talk about it. Um, plus I'm, I have a pulse on that, right? We yeah. have a pulse oh, on our kids. Yeah. Um, but it is scary. Like a lot of things in life, anything is addictive, right? People have addictions to food and alcohol and sex and porn and, and gambling and totally. all, right? Yeah. So it's just another right. um, uh, thing that goes into that. A tool. That, it's right. well, I, think I it's, use it as a tool in my practice. So yeah. for me, that was it. I gave my kids a tool to put in their toolbox. And if they thought they could benefit from it, I wanted them to have the ability to reach into the toolbox. And it's ironically how they both use it now. When you start to kind of recognize that your kid might have trouble learning within that environment. So mm -hmm. that, that structured environment of sitting down <laughs> and trying to sit still and try to memorize things and, and produce a good grade. Uh, how many times have you gone through with parents of like exploring other options? Like the, there's other ways mm -hmm. uh, to get education in terms of, I forget the name of like some of these different options of different schooling sure. principles. Like even if it's responsive we, classroom and things like that. Right. Or you're yeah. out you're more hands-on is more right. visual based. Like that's uh, right. Montessori. Montessori. Right. Thank yeah. you. Montessori yeah. school. And you know, I think it is so important if your child is at risk, if their problems get in the way of their development, you need to think about where you're placing them. I work in all different schools. And one of the big questions that come up is, is this really the best place for your child? Mm. And I think, you know, and a lot of these are private schools and they're like, well, we need the body. No, actually the body needs a different environment. And so they understand that. Um, so at a younger age, I think it isn't, it's up to us to help them navigate yeah. the environment that we put them in so that they can succeed. And when kids get to the high school level, it's, I mean, we happen to be in a, a, 
an area in the world where we have a plethora of options so many and choices. education. I mean, just ridiculous amounts of um, schools and different um, types of learning environments. And I think it is important to find the one that's best for your child. But mm. it, it, it's it's even more than that, too. That's a huge piece of it. But if you're in, let's say, even a socioeconomic situation that you've got you've got a public school and that's your only option you don't you can't afford Mm -hmm. private you can't afford montessori you can't deviate um or charter then it becomes an issue of understanding as a parent or as an educator that you're we all learn in in such different ways you know some of us are visual learners auditory Mm -hmm. learners you know um, hands-on learners. And and I know as, you know, the mother of two daughters who had radically different, <laughs> I mean, like mm-hmm. night and day, different kinds of styles. My oldest could sit down and bury herself and immerse herself and, and, and be there for hours and hours and hours and was the one that could read the 200 pages and absorb it and process it. And then my youngest, in fact, Deb and I were just talking about this yesterday, um, that I used to have to break down reading assignments, like if my daughter, my youngest had to read, uh, you know, like a summer reading book and you'd get like your three or four books that you had to read. And I'd make it about math. Like, okay, well, we've got, there are, you know, 60 days until school is back in session and you've got, you know, this number of books, this many pages, let's divide it out. You don't have to sit down and read 400 pages at, at a time. We can, let's, let's read 10 pages at a time. You know, so it's, it's all about, even if we don't have the ability to, to pick those options of, of other books, institutions, we at least understand that there are so many different ways that we can mm. teach our children how to learn and, and flesh out the the ways that they learn best. Mm. What's the age gap between the two again? Mine? Yeah. My youngest is 19. My oldest is 22. Okay. Do you, do you think that there was any sort of difference on how they used like social media yeah. and tools like that? Yeah, definitely. In I fact, see. it's funny. We talk about this in my house from time to time that even with a gap as, as short as three years, my oldest can leave her phone on her desk, go downstairs and play the piano for three hours or, you know, sit on the couch, read a book, do something completely separate from social media, her phone devices, and not think twice about it. My youngest, it's, I mean, she would sooner lose an actual arm than a phone. It would, that would be the thing that she would sacrifice the body part mm-hmm. as opposed to the, yeah. the phone. Yeah. And, and it's just in a matter of those few years where even in the way that, that my oldest and my youngest engage with people, we talked about, you know, a while ago when we first sat down, we were talking about how, um, you know, my youngest, her generation, they're the ones that'll text all afternoon until their plans are made instead mm-hmm. of picking up the telephone. My oldest will pick up the telephone and has no hesitation yeah. to just call a friend. So... Yeah, even though it's a three-year difference and that's not huge, it it was um, it translated to a pretty big gap in the way that they utilize. Sometimes I, I sometimes I wonder if that's what feeds into this distractibility for these kids, especially I, if you're somebody who's diagnosed. I, we see with, it in schools a lot that kids um, get bored very easily right. during lectures because they're not as stimulating as as uh, you know looking at a phone. It's very um, stimulating and constant and scrolling through and seeing tons of images and information being thrown at you. And I think that it does, uh, it does impact the teacher. They cannot compete with the technology. They're up there, they're giving their lecture and, you know, you're learning about World War II, (laughs) you know, it's, it's not as exciting. And so they are up against oftentimes a lot of discussions around how do we compete with and how do we um, engage kids in a way that we can get to them and reach them because they really, you know, they really aren't interested in the same way as they used to be because they, you know, be playing Mario Kart and catching all the Mario's coins. Awesome. Yeah, the other, I, I, yeah. My boys turned me on to it. I, I play Mario Kart. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. the, the other the thing that I think is. kind of jives with that that whole mm-hmm. technology piece is the is the sense nowadays that or it's not even a sense it's just the reality nowadays that that this generation or my youngest generation 
has to have everything in real time immediately has to has mm-hmm. to have the answer has to have the contact Instant has gratification. To, yeah and amazon prime amazon yeah, prime oh, yeah right. that's right and, and that's been it's the drive through generation yeah. like i'm mm-hmm. if i want it i'm just going to drive up to that building and ask for it and i'm going to get it on the other side of the building i saw like i that. saw a mcdonald's mm-hmm. commercial last night it actually made me laugh that I mean, if McDonald's wasn't fast enough already, right? And you didn't have a drive. Now they have the app. App, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like can, Dunkin' Donuts. You can right. you can order order pay, and it's ready as soon as you get there. Like it's like wow, yeah. we, we it's we can't sit. We don't wait. know how to wait anymore. Yeah, no. Yeah. And I and think we all we, we all grew up in the the <laughs> when you get online, right? It took fifteen minutes just to get connected yeah, to online. Your, that was your just, modem. Oh, yeah. Dial up was, yeah. Yeah, was death. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's what's your what is your hope with this book? What do you you, what do you hope it help it does for people? You know, we want to start a movement. I mean, it, too many parents, and I, I say this all the time, too many parents now are just wrapped so tightly around the axle of life and, and of, you know, their kids achieving and them achieving and they're paying more attention to what's going on outside their house and their family unit. And and they're they're so worried that if, if anything isn't done at the highest possible level that their kid is screwed and their future is screwed and they're mm-hmm. a failure as a parent. So, you know, we, we see this, you know, you see a lot of parenting books out there and, and not to shit on any of them because, you know, they're all valuable, but they, you know, there, there's one X factor that most books out there don't focus on. And that's, the fact that it's okay to screw up, it's okay as life as, is messy. That's right. That's as right. a kid, as a parent, and and mm-hmm. we really, I mean, that's that's been my ultimate goal. Deb's ultimate goal is is to remind parents that and kids that you know it's it's okay to you know be in a different lane. It's okay to get there at a different time. It's okay. We don't all ride a bike. Learn how to ride a bike on the same day. And, um, you know, we, we would love to create a movement around this notion that um, it's, it's all right to drop balls. It's okay to be imperfect. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, 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 it's okay to, you know, have a moment and then right. recover from that moment and, and move on. So that's, yeah. that's. And that, and that imperfection doesn't mean it does not equal lack of success. Right. You know, parents are so worried about that. And I try and help them understand even messing up is, adding to their um, success that they're going to learn something from it, which mm-hmm. is going to make them a better person. Right. That's also great. try and define success. You know? Yeah. What success does that for me, honestly, when people ask me that question, I, I first, uh, without your health, you have nothing, right? Um, uh, their happiness. And I hope that they get to do something that they love to do each and every day, like I do. <laughs> And there you go. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yes. Thanks for coming on. Oh, it's my yeah. pleasure. Yeah, this is great. Thanks for having us. Thank yes. you. Great time, guys. Thank you.